Well, thank you, Emily. Good evening. Welcome to Cross Lutheran Church for our third midweek service in Advent. I'm Pastor Lori. Emily, Chelsea, and I are glad that you're worshiping with us this evening. If you're visiting, welcome. We're glad that you joined us. We thank Jamie Goodnecht for serving as our reader this evening. Our midweek Advent theme is centered around living this season of the church year intentionally with hope, peace, joy, and love. The daily intentions that you receive with your bulletin also include a scripture verse, and we encourage you to use these as a daily devotion. Please continue to join us for worship next week and participate in those weekly practices as we explore what it means to wait with hope, peace, joy, and love. This week's focus is on joy. Remember that your offering may be sent to the church office. 2021 envelopes can be picked up in the Narthex hallway closest to the kitchen. If you'd like to help with their delivery, please call the church office. There may also be picked up on Wednesday, December 16th, between 10.30 and 2, or on Thursday, December 17th, between 5.30 and 8.30. Thank you. And now we begin tonight's service with a call to worship. For many people, Advent is a time of extreme busyness and stress. For others, it might be a time of sadness, grief, and withdrawal. Or ironically, it might even be both at the same time. The expectations of what this time is supposed to be can put anxiety into any of us. This year, we will strive to live these days proactively and as simply as possible during the time of safe distancing and missing family and friends. We'll start each day with the intention of finding something good in our lives. We will see God and God's creation and God's people and do our best to seek joy. We sing our opening hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, in the ELW number 257, verses 5 and 6. God of joy, we are so happy to be here with you. Help us make room for you in our busy lives. We need to hear, see, and taste your goodness. Be with us, hold us, accompany us as we seek your joy, not only during this Advent season, 
but throughout the year. We confess our sins and receive absolution. God, you know us. We want to be joyful more often than we are. We want to laugh more than we do. We want to smile instead of finding fault. We find so many reasons to be angry or upset or frustrated. Help us to find true joy with the intention of truly living in your world, not just observing, critiquing, or giving up on it. Be patient with us as we learn to celebrate all your creation with joy. Be patient with us as we seek your delight even in the midst of all life's challenges. God forgives us in all we do. We give you thanks for your unconditional love and compassion. Amen. We pray together the prayer of the day found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts in joy, O God, as we are cloaked in praise and delight for the gift of your salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue our service with the reading. Our first lesson is Psalm 84, verse 1 through 10. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As you go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Behold our shield, O God. Look at the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of the wickedness. Here ends the lesson. Our second lesson comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading for this evening is from the 20th chapter of John, beginning with the 11th verse. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, it is. It is the temple, the sanctuary, the synagogue, the building, which houses the very presence of God. 
This is the lovely dwelling place the sons of Korah write about that you just heard read in Psalm 84. They actually led a revolt against Moses and Aaron to bring about a change in leadership. And as these opposing leaders stood outside their tent, the ground actually opened up and consumed Korah and some others. And so the few that survived this were spared, and they were then assigned as servants in the temple. So there really is a poignant meaning in verse 10, which says, it is better to be servants in the house of the Lord than in tents of those who oppose the Lord. Is there joy in that, though? Well, there is in this psalm, because this psalm is still a celebration and praise of the temple thought to be King Solomon's temple as the dwelling place of God. For those seeking God there, dwelling among the mortals, right? Human beings, people like you and me. So it's no wonder that this psalm also says, happy are those who live in your house, because even the birds want to be there, building their nests for their young. This psalm was spoken and sung by pilgrims who sought and who desired the presence of the Lord because the temple was seen as the closest point, the closest point of contact between heaven and earth and was actually that holy place where the two realms overlapped. It was for pilgrims to come there who needed hope in the midst of trouble, who were looking for peace in the midst of chaos and war and comfort in the midst of distress. Could be today, right? The temple provided the renewal, as our psalmist reminds us. Yet there was an assumption at the same time that God was out in the world. The temple, or the synagogue, was a way for people to gather and to give thanks, to sing praises and hymns, to be uplifted and to be empowered, And then they were to enter back into the physical world with eyes that were more open to the living presence of God out there, too. That's true today, too, isn't it? Worship still is a life-giving relationship between us and God. But we can't stay in the temple forever, nor can God be contained in the temple there either. So as people came and went... It was thought that they spread God's blessings throughout the land. True today, too, as we sing a sending hymn and are sent out to love and to serve God. And today, as we look around at all the churches, no one church is exactly identical to that singular temple that was in Jerusalem and what that stood for thousands of years ago although this sanctuary might be, sanctuary might actually be that for most, if not all, of Cross Lutheran's members. Even though we are unable to worship here physically at this time. This psalm that was read to, uh, this evening was written about 600 years before the birth of Christ. Yet the temple is still understood as the realm connecting heaven and earth. And Advent, Advent is a reminder for us as we await Jesus' coming that he will bridge that connection between heaven and earth as God's Son, the revelation of God in a profoundly new and different way. And we know that Jesus would even refer to his body as the temple. He does that in the second chapter of the Gospel of John when he cleanses the temple itself. The Jerusalem temple is really beside the point then because Jesus breaking into the kingdom becomes now the living proof. It's identifiable proof that God is no longer contained, right? The Holy of Holies, the center of the temple where God was thought to dwell has now been set free in this new kind of way, on the loose as a tiny baby in a lowly manger. The Son of God now revealed in a new way. 
So the Advent story reminds us that we're called to be church too in sharing the story and welcoming others with joy, the same joy as the angels in our Christmas story. We're also called to invite others to church, to welcome with the same hospitality Jesus did, those on the edges, the marginalized, the poor, the unclean, the widow, and the orphan, the foreign foreigner and the stranger, they belong here too. We're to welcome others with joy. You know, there is the story of a pastor who served an urban congregation that began a worship service for all of the homeless people who gathered near the church. And some folks thought this was a great idea. Others weren't so sure. Welcoming all walks of people is what it means to be the church, though, right? But problems can arise with that, and in this case, they did. Finally, one of the problems that they were encountering actually was the straw that broke the camel's back. And one of the members came to the pastor and asked, do we really need to have this service? Why are we doing this? And the pastor replied in his direct but quiet manner. He said, We're doing this so the people won't go to hell. And the member replied to him, we need to have this service so those people won't go to hell? No, the pastor responded, we need to have this service so we won't go to hell. The point is, we have each, each and every one of us, become a living, breathing, walking temple of the Holy Spirit as people of Pentecost, right, and as followers of Jesus. And the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts today can inspire that same awe, wonder, and joy that's evident in Psalm 84. Because we know through our faith that God is still on the loose, like the temple embodied in Jesus, which then points us right back out the door from the temple, the church, to the outside world where Jesus lived among us, among Jews and Gentiles alike, as the circle of welcome grew larger. And if Jesus declares himself the new temple, it means that we can't keep God in the box anymore either. We can't keep God in the temple or the church because Emmanuel has come. We have God among us in us and through us, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're reminded in Scripture that we are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in us. And Philippians 4.4 that was read today invites us to rejoice again. It says rejoice with the good news that we're called to bear. It's to be done with joy. Even those times where our faith may be lacking and those doubts might surface, that we can or we are making a difference. Well, Mary must have doubted too. Mary must have doubted in our gospel story that was read tonight. Otherwise, she would not have come to his grave to check on his body. It's a mystery to her, and it frightens her that Jesus is gone. His body must have been different as she doesn't recognize him at first. At first, he speaks to Mary, and she thinks he's the gardener. It takes him calling her by name for her to truly recognize who he is. And then Jesus says something else to her. He tells Mary not to hold on to him because he has not yet ascended to the Father. But she is to go to Jesus' brothers and tell them that he will. He says he will go to my father as your father, to my God as your God. This story tells us that Jesus is still on the move, out of God's temple in the time of David, right, to the manger, out into the world, to the cross, out of the tomb, and then into the world again for 40 days until his ascension which finds us still waiting today until he comes again in the fulfillment of the kingdom. But we can't forget 
we can't forget that Jesus told Mary to go and to tell. He sends her out, much like we're sent out each Sunday when we leave the temple, God's church for us on earth today. It is also much like those shepherds that were sent on that starry night to the manger, and the same as the magi. Upon seeing the Christ child for themselves, they're sent home a different way to share their story in what they saw. Mary is the first apostle. The word means sent. And we are apostles too. We carry the body of Christ within us as we wait for the Christmas story in our journey through Advent and to Bethlehem. But in the meantime, we're also sent out to share the good news, you know, for the, the love, that message that we share from the beginning of God's story of love for us in the Old Testament into the New Testament and out to the future as we wait and we wait some more for the cycle to start all over again. You know, after the story of the empty tomb, Mary Magdalene is never heard from again. But in our gospel story, she is the first. She is the first to see the risen Lord, and she wastes no time in sharing the good news with others and declaring, I have seen the Lord. And like Mary, we're called to share it too, to recognize that nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God, even revealing God's self in a baby, born in a lowly stable to a teenage girl and a wandering husband, surrounded by animals in the most unlikely of places. The temple finds a new home in him. So during Advent, we wait to experience again our own joyous expectation that Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one who keeps rising to meet us in his temple body known as the church and in our own body, minds, and spirits through the Holy Spirit's presence in us. Joy to the earth. The Savior reigns. Amen. We sing our hymn of the day, Rejoice, Rejoice Believers, number 244 in the ELW.
the prayers of the people. Creator God, teach us to laugh with the joy of children. Create in us the love of life and joy of spirit that will see you in all of your creation. Help us to live this day intentionally with you. Christ, help us to invite others to laugh with us. Help us to reach out with love and hospitality to all our neighbors. Help us to live this day intentionally with you. Spirit, what a wonderful gift is laughter. Thank you for giving us the ability to sing, laugh, and share the joy of laughter with others. Make us bold in our daring to bring your joy into places where it is rarely experienced so others might see your delight in them. Help us to live this day intentionally with you. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may we see the joy of God in all creation. May we see the joy of God in all people. May we see the joy of God in all the moments of our days. May we live with hope, peace, and joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our sending hymn in the ELW number 267, Joy to the World. go with joy to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Mm-hmm. 